The streaming's up and running now, Councillor. Thank you. So I think we can start this meeting of the Children and Young People Scrutiny Committee, 10th of January 1922. Welcome everybody. Thanks for turning up. Um, we've got uh, a special meeting today, which is particularly focusing on the um, MTFP. So it might be good if you're making some comments that uh, you refer to the section that you're speaking about. And at that, I'll hand over first, I think, to I think be Elizabeth, just to take us briefly through uh, an update. We should have all seen this uh, MTFP before, but if it, Elizabeth, can you just lead off, please? Of course I can, Chair. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I think looking around the uh, table, most members were able to attend the MTFP, MTFP briefing that Better Myself gave before Christmas, which was the general overview. Um, this committee today is about specific, really, any specific questions that you have with regard to children and young people in the MTFP. Um, but also, we will, of course, answer any questions you have in general on the whole MTFP as it's... Uh, sorry, I can't get my teeth in, it's Monday morning. Anyway, um, just so there's no confusion, though, it is for this committee to forward any views or comments it may have on the MTFP, and in particular those relation to services and finances, specifically in the remit of this committee, to the Economy and Resources Committee on the 20th of January. At this meeting, all the views from all of the scrutiny committees will be noted, and an overall response will therefore then be forwarded to Cabinet, who will then take it into considerations before proposing the final MTFP to Council in February. Um, before we go into questions, I would like to update you on the finance settlement. Uh, the uh, draft MTFP was uh, sent out before we had received that. The Basically, the council tax and preset levels remain as we expected at 2% and 1% respectively. And it's assumed that they are increased at that level as they are included in the government's core spending power that's being published. The 1.5 billion, some of you may recall from the autumn statement announced, um, has been split into two areas. That we've got there's 822 million for the services grant, which is not a ring fence grant, and there's also 636 million for social care specifically. Obviously, children's services would would fall into that category. Um, Darlington's allocations are 1.579 million and 1.162 million respectively, so it's slightly higher than the 2.7 million that we'd originally thought we were going to get in the medium term financial plan. Um, we've been told that the services grant is a one off, one year allocation, while the government reviews the whole of the local government finance system. And in that case, it wouldn't be included in any baseline figures for any protections if the funding were to drop in future years. The good news is that they have extended our new homes bonus allocation for another year. So any houses that were built between or came online between October 20 and October 21 would be included in that. Darlington had a buoyant market, so it is good news for us and we will get 1.4 million above anticipated. There were also a couple of reductions on the draft budget, things like the top up grant. But overall, we will get over about 1.1 million extra from the settlement from this draft MTFP that you're looking at now. Uh, I suppose I just want to say that whilst the short term nature of the services grant is disappointing, it, um, I can understand why they've done it, because the uh, local government finance system has been looking or needing an overhaul for some time. Um, it's just been postponed for a number of years um, because of things like Brexit and COVID. Um, so it, it is understandable whilst disappointing. Um, Overall, it doesn't really affect the MTFP, the four years. It's nice to have some more money, but uh, overall, we already could afford the MTFP. But what it means is that gap at the end will be slightly lower. Um, we also will be looking at quarter three budget revenue management results, uh, and they will also be included in the next rendition of the MTFP. So really, Chair, it's over to yourselves to ask any specific questions um, you have. And obviously, we've got officers here as well who will be able to help with those. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I just wondered if it might be appropriate this time to um, ask uh, Chris. I mean, obviously, he was um, involved in the build-up of the budget. And I don't know that, you know, if, if there was any particular things that he thought should have been in there that weren't, or if... Uh, the build-up's been as normal and there are amounts of money in there to cover all of the things that he's got, bearing in mind that we still have some uncertainties about that. Now, I wonder if you just say a couple of uh, words, Chris, please. 
Thank you, Chair, of course. Um, I think the the situation with, with children's services probably remains as as it's been for, for recent years, which is there's quite a level of unpredictability. And I know we get that with public services across the board, but I do think in in social care, particularly in children's and adult services, we do work within quite a quite an unpredictable landscape. So we, we, we do our work really closely with, with Brett and Elizabeth and their teams in terms of understanding that. And, and certainly from a service provision, um, we're really um, appreciative of the, the ongoing support that we've got to continue the Strengthening Families programme. And, and, you know, it's it's remiss to consider the financial implications without also considering the Strengthening family side, because actually what we're really key on is our improvement journey um, is all built into to effective um, spend really moving forward and if we have really effective um, high quality services then the the spend will be appropriate according to that as well moving forward so it's really pleasing that we've been supported to continue on the strengthening families journey uh, moving forward the, the the biggest challenge I, I think is is still the ongoing um, issues really around the the pandemic um, and what that means for for services and I know it's you know it's within the report so I won't kind of redo those but we are moving forward we're in a very different position clearly to to to, to over the last 18 months and, and we're moving forward with that but the what that means for for children and their families in in Darlington is still um is still changeable it's still dynamic and so as a service we need to respond to that so I suppose the the short answer is um chair yes I'm I'm satisfied that that kind of the support that we've got financially allows us to deliver our services, um, you know, in the coming year and feel we can do that um, kind of caveated with that slight. It's a very dynamic and unpredictable area, as we all know, um, and, and just one that we have to really keep a close eye on, particularly with those wider factors that that the pandemic and, and the ongoing impact on families has brought, really. OK, thanks for that, Chris. I just thought it was worth having your view as you were the, yeah, no oh, you were the owner of the the the, the, the select section of the budget that we of should course. be focusing on that's all right um, um councillor snegger i think you were the first to put your hand up yes yeah, so, so, thank you chair it was just um just really so helping you out i noticed you didn't um ask for uh declaration of interest at the start of the meeting um so just to help you out there as we're discussing as all the papers are up for discussion i'd just like to declare a non pecuniary interest on uh, paragraph 61 of the cabinet report it makes reference to Darnton Credit Union, which I'm uh, an unpaid um, chair of the board there. So just for clarity, I um, want to declare that interest. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, have we got any other questions? Councillor Renton has his hand up, Pair Chair. OK, I'm just, he's just popped up. Uh, right, uh, Mike, if you want to go, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I'm not entirely sure how to word my question, but this year there have been quite a few stories in the in the national press about local authorities potentially underfunding their children's services. But when we get given a document like this, it just tells us the cost of the service and how much we're putting to it. So we don't actually know whether we're underfunding overfunding or just right funding in our children's services how do we measure that how do we know if we're at the right funding level and uh if so what is our current level <laughs> easy one to answer uh mike that one i don't know who's going to take that one i mean the the budget's built up um, in, in in consultation with the people that's running the service. So maybe Brett might like to say something about that. Uh, yes, <coughs> thanks, Councillor. Um, yeah, as you say, the, the budget has been built based on the information available from um, the service managers and the budget managers. So they meet with finance colleagues and identify um, the budget requirement for the coming year uh, and the life of the MTFP. So um, we would go through and set a budget uh, in proportion to uh, those requirements that are, are requested, uh, along with the current year's budget um, and any issues that we're experiencing in the current year. So, for example, if we're experiencing any budget pressures in the current year, we would obviously look at those and see how those are going to pan out over the next few years. 
So the budget is built based on the best information available at that point in time. But as Chris has alluded to, uh, this is an area of budget where there are uh, significant fluctuations uh, just dependent on the number of children that are actually accessing services at that point in time. So uh, it could well be that we would build a budget today and if uh, a number of children were identified as requiring support in six months time, we may not have those in the budget. But we always do build the budget with a um, a, a, a bit of um, scope within there for changes over the forthcoming year. So we don't, for example, just budget exactly for the number of children we have now. Uh, we budget based on experience over the last couple of years and what's coming through uh, requiring support going forward. Um, in terms of trying to answer the question on whether or not uh, they're under or overfunded, I mean, the service has had significant increases in funding over the last number of years in children's services. A lot more funding has gone in uh, to children's services and that's mirrored the expenditure within children's services. So over the last few years, we have seen an increase in expenditure in children's services. So likewise, we've had to increase the budget for those as well. Um, whether or not that's enough depends on future demand and how we deliver services in the future and the success of our Strengthening Families programme that again Chris alluded to earlier um, with, with um, keeping an eye on that demand for services and exactly how those services are delivered. Uh, in the current year, all we can really go on in terms of saying whether or not the services is, is, is fully funded is what our current year budget position is. Um, I don't have the quarter three budget position at the moment. That's something that we're just finalising um, post Christmas. But at quarter two, we weren't saying that we were having any significant pressures in children's services. So at that point in time, we would say that the budget for the current year was sufficient. And that's what we've used our uh, as our starting point for building the budget for, for future years. But as I say, due to the volatility um, of the budget and the, the, the way that demand can change on a daily basis, there's always scope for change in the budget requirement. Thanks, Brett. I, I just, Chris, were you responding to that same question? Yeah, I was just kind of going to build so, on, on Brett's Cindy, point. Cindy, can I just, to... you were number one, Cindy, but I'll just let Chris respond to that if you don't mind. It was just really going back to Councillor Renton's query of kind of how we know in terms of, of the service, I suppose, and, and we, you know, we do closely, um, you know, monitor and, and analyse our performance. And, and I suppose the, the point of having this budget at its at its base level is to allow is to allow us as a council to ensure that, that the statutory needs of children and families in Darlington are met. Um, and really the, the measurement of whether that's proportionate or not is, is around the outcomes that the children and families that access our services get. So it's about really me, um, you know, as the assistant director from the service, having a real confidence that we have sufficient social workers in order to provide good quality and timely services and that those families are receiving good outcomes and, and really that's the the measurement at the end of it we we are expecting Ofsted to, to come and visit us at some stage during 2022 that will again give us a full inspection and a, and a yardstick in terms of the the quality of the services that we provide and, and hopefully give um give members some some kind of that you know an eye into that external scrutiny that we have in terms of how we're delivering um and, and i guess it just brings me back to you know that point brett made that it is it is very very unpredictable because if you know if we identify tomorrow that a, a young person um you know requires an, an alternative place to be looked after because of their safety we know that that nationally it's a real issue with the the real significant costs and, and the challenges around the placement market i'm I'm sure members are aware there's there's an independent um, review of children's social care going on nationally at the moment, which it's anticipated will um, will publish their report. I think it's that well we've been given the spring as a date, which is obviously quite a a loose date, but but spring of of this year, and we're hoping that that'll address some of the the market issues in placements, which which do incur a significant costs as a well as not just as a children's service but as a council so I guess there's a number of contextual things going on underneath on a national level but at, at its base level it's around us having a, a confidence that we can share with yourselves that the services we provide for our families are good and, and helping them get good outcomes and then that external um, really evaluation and inspection that we get through Ofsted. Okay can thanks I, Chris. Um, Councillor Hughes. I, sorry can I come back in on that? I, I'm quite finished there. Oh, sorry, Mike. So, um, 
so so if you're saying that the heads of departments go to the finance people brett and elizabeth for example and come to them with their uh budget potentially is there a negotiation do you come up with a here's the best case scenario here's worst case scenario and here's where we can just manage how does that look i think we uh, do you want to come in Brett, on that uh, I can do firstly, if you would like, Chris. Um, yeah, Councillor Renton, uh, it, it, it's a matter of setting the budget in line with uh, what we think is the most appropriate budget going forward for, for the need and the demand. So uh, uh, just picking up on your comment there, if a budget manager comes to us with a wish list and aspirations, we don't necessarily build that every single thing into the budget going forward. Um, we are constrained by the amount of resources that we have available, so we have to build a realistic budget, both in terms of the funding available, but also the service requirement on the ground. So there is, a, a picking up on, on what you said, there is a negotiation with the budget managers, between budget managers and finance on, on trying to identify what is the most realistic budget uh, requirement going forward. So we'll build a budget, as Chris says, based on um, the more straightforward things such as how many social workers we have and we can budget exactly for those because we have a structure uh, and we know what people are paid and etc etc so we we build for all of those uh, on a very sort of sound basis of of, e of easy knowledge that's available but then there are those volatile um, areas where things are subject to change so a, a key example there is placements of children so we can obviously budget for the the children that we currently have in placement and we know uh, how long those children are going to remain in placement so they, they can be accurately uh, budgeted based on that placement as at now although of course some children do move placement during the year um, even even if they're reasonably settled in that placement they can still change throughout that but we can pretty much set that uh, with a degree of certainty uh, but then we also would budget for um, other children coming through based on um, where we think we're at with uh, historical data but also data going forward and where service managers think um, the service is going but uh, there's certainly challenge in all the budget setting processes uh, to make sure that we set the most accurate budget that we can going forward. Okay so, so we're, we're happy with the level of service that's the best we can do and what we do is we match the budget to that level of service not the other way around. Good. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Councillor Hughes, we've got sat there a long time waiting. Can you come in now, please? Yeah, no problem. Um, my first question is what is the overspend in children's services for um, the last year, uh, following on from Councillor Renton's question? Because obviously we budget at a certain level and then things that we maybe didn't anticipate need to be paid for so I'd like to know what the overspend was this year um, and secondly this is really a plea and I'm not sure how we can manage this but our um, responsibility and the responsibility of the lead member is much wider than just children's services and I know that there's a lot of money spent on children and young people throughout the budget and it would be really great if we could somehow get a clearer picture of that because obviously we're, we're talking specifically about those young people in care or needing early help with their families, that kind of thing. But there are lots of other people that are on the edges that are receiving services from the council that hopefully can assist in saving money in children's services. Um, so I'm not sure how we can do that, but it would be great if, if the minds gathered around this virtual table can think about that for the future, um, because I think it's an important element of what we're doing and what we're spending overall. My other question is in relation to the adoption agency, and that is, I remember when we signed up to that, that there was um, the possibility of money coming back to us. I noticed there's only a small increase in that budget, uh, but I also remember as we've had reports over the past year from the adoption agency that um, Darlington children, the numbers were actually fewer um, being adopted from previous years. So there, I know that that was a discussion that we had initially. Clearly, it might be that the on costs are such that 
there isn't much of a savings to us. But that's another part of my question. Um, and also, I just want to say how happy I am that um, it's been made clear that we're being asked to comment specifically on children's services issues. So those issues involving the budgets concerning children and young people, because I really believe that that's our area of expertise and to expect us to do anything else at this meeting would be not acceptable. So I'm pleased that that's been changed for this year. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Who's going to take those ones then? Any volunteers? I'm happy to uh, try and answer some of those, uh, Chair, if that's OK. Thanks, Brett. Um, if I just try and remember your, your questions in order there, uh, Councillor Hughes. Uh, in, in terms of the current year um, budget management position for, for children's social care, um, as I say, we don't actually have the quarter three figures at the moment. We're just finalising those so that they'll be available um, in the next couple of weeks. But, but at quarter two, um, children's social care was actually projected to be more or less on target, the budget at quarter two. So we weren't actually expecting uh, massive or, or any any pressures as such at that point in time obviously that's subject to change based on what comes through over the autumn period um, and the remainder of the financial year so as i say we'll have a, a more clearer picture on on that uh, in a couple of weeks time in terms of last year again on children's social care we did actually have an overspend at, at the year end but um, that overspend and from memory was roughly about half a million pounds but that was actually additional covid costs that we had um, and the way we did our budget management last year is we stripped out the COVID costs from, from regular uh, normal expenditure within the budget um, and if we hadn't have had the COVID costs the budget would have been more or less on target again at outturn so um, the budget position for last year excluding COVID and again um, at quarter two of this year were pretty much um, online. The only thing I would say is that, as, as I touched on earlier, is that we have significantly increased the budget in, in children's services over the last few years. So obviously uh, the, the base budget that we're comparing against is higher than it used to be uh, three or four years ago uh, with regard to those. Um, with regard to ad adoption tees valley sorry i may have missed a, a question there uh, chris may know the detail better than myself but i am aware that there has been a number of pieces of work that the board have been looking at recently uh, with regard to the charges for adoption tees valley uh, and they've looked uh, at a couple of areas basically how the charges are split across the five tees authorities that contribute and there's been a number of um methods put forward on how they would be split going forward um, which is based on on a number of things uh, around uh, work interventions and number of children etc etc et so i believe that they're in the process of being agreed um, for the forthcoming financial year which should see a change in how our, our charge is made in darlington going forward and i do believe that um, at this point in time that new split would actually reduce our charge going forward but again it depends on the expenditure uh, for the adoption agency uh, next year uh, and going forward the second area that they're looking at as well has been um, adoption tees valley obviously is, is an adoption service but we still do have to place some children with other uh, other local authority areas so it, it's something that's called interagency fee so basically where we uh, either place a child at another local authority or vice versa um, one of the non tees valley um, local authorities places a child through our adoption one and, and there's a charge that's done for that um, and we have been spending um, a number of um, years on actually spending more for placing child out of the Tees Valley than, than vice versa so that's another area where they've where they've done quite a lot of work to look at that and um, to see how that could be uh, reduced in the future and looked at how actually uh, adoption Tees Valley works itself and potentially doing some more work in house to to reduce those costs going forward so uh, again that's um, not all being agreed as far as I'm aware but if if we can do more in-house, that would save on those costs going forward in the future. Yeah, thanks, Brett. It's nice to know that that's uh, what, up at the top of the agenda. Um, Cindy, the, there was the, the other question was about uh, expenditure from the council on other areas. 
I don't think we're going to get an answer to that one today, but I think you've planted the seed in everyone's head on this committee. And maybe, maybe our next scrutiny committee, we may put some questions to the, to the cabinet to, to get them to think about that one. Thank you, Chair. Um, because one of the things that um, Chris mentioned about you know, being reactive, that, that's my concern, that if we had more knowledge of how money is being spent, um, we could move from being reactive to being proactive, so that if we see trends, we would be able to, and I'm sure that that's going on at some level, um, but I think that it would be useful to have a, a more um, joined up approach to the issues facing children and young people um, in Darlington. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Hughes. Councillor Snicker. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I don't know if, Chris, you had your hand up. Was that to respond to, to Councillor Hughes or you wanted to come it in? It was, if, if possible, oh, Councillor Snicker. Yeah, if, sure, if I'll give you away. Allow, that would be great. Thank you. It was just, to, I think, to reassure Councillor Hughes, when I, when I say reactive, the, the very nature, I think, of the strengthening families work is built on the premise that, you know, getting involved with children and families as early on in the kind of life of their, their challenges and issues is, is absolutely the right way to be. So there's very much, a, I guess, a, a um, a proactive approach within that that part of the service um but you know we notwithstanding all of that there is still situations where you know families aren't known to us and when they do become known to us there are there are significant challenges around it but i, I would agree that your your suggestion of how we can look right the way across you know the budget and the wider services in terms of the answers to that is a is a really valid one it was just to, to confirm that i would breath um, Brett's update in terms of adoption T's value were, were, were entirely accurate. That's being looked at within their board. We are represented by by James as, as director um, of people on that board, and, and that will, as, as Brett said, be reflected in, in the, the budget and for the year to come. And the, the plan is also for adoption T's value to continue to, to share their annual report within um, within the ongoing scrutiny committee, so that gives another another kind of arm for yourselves to have that that real eye into into the service and the outcomes for for our children and families through that. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, Councillor Snecker. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, first first point, I suppose. Whether it, apologies if I'm having a second bite at Councillor Renton's question because it was it was on my list. Um, maybe coming at it a different way. Uh, if if we're if we're satisfied about, if we want to satisfy ourselves about funding, uh, maybe another question to ask is, um, what would be the first thing that we would spend on if council um, local authority funding was improved from central government? So what would be the first thing that we would spend on within this department that we currently don't? Would you like me to come in on that chair? Yes, please. That's probably my easiest question for today councillor Stecker. It, it would be an increased early help offer it would be increasing the size and the scope of our early help offer um i would kind of reiterate what i said earlier which is that brett elizabeth and, and team are really um supportive around the the need for us not just to be delivering on our statutory services and actually that that early intervention um through our early help offer is key to, to reducing the statutory demand but you know, as I'm sure members appreciate, it can be quite difficult to, to evidence the outcomes of that. So by providing a service, if if we if that prevents a family from needing um, more invasive and more expensive statutory intervention, it can be really difficult to evidence and articulate that because the, the counter argument could have been, well, they may well not have ended up needing that even if you hadn't intervened at an early stage. But um, I'm really proud that in Darlington we're not just providing a, a statutory offer of, of what families need and we still have that early help offer. But I, I do believe that the larger the the early help offer, the the greater chance we have of reduction, reducing the demand at the kind of higher cost statutory intervention level. But that's not to say we don't have an early help offer. Just if if I was asked what I would like to expand, it would be you know a a more wide range and early help offer. So so um, that's a very clear message, Chris. I was I was kind of anticipating that answer, but it's great to have it articulated by yourself there. So as far as invest to save um, recommendations from this committee, it may well be that um, bolstering your 
departments spending in that area would would reap rewards not only in the 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 quality of life and the safety of our children and young people in the borough but also later on intervention more invasive more expensive intervention so it would be a really a double win financially and socially to to increase the budget line for that so so thanks for that one um on on the cabinet report um paragraphs 26 27 we were talking about um that's a reduced income part of the cabinet report I, I was really disappointed obviously we we received funding for transformation of of care but covid got in the way um and it's acknowledged in in paragraph 27 that uh, that that's now a, a cost pressure to us as a council uh, it's disappointed to see that you know circumstances beyond our control prevented us fully using that money um, to to really transfer and improve um, our children's care I was it's just wondering again as a, as a as a scrutiny committee is there anything we can do to to feed that back up that that was a, a really bad decision not to continue the funding into 22 23 and you know has that has that point been made and is there any other way that we can support that that message being louder and amplifying that call uh, I think Elizabeth put a hand up probably to answer that question. Yes, thank you. I just need to be clear. We didn't lose the money. We just mm -hmm. didn't get any extra. So we still got all of the money that we were asked we asked for and the programme. It was just that because of COVID, we weren't be able to we weren't able, and Chris, I'm sure will confirm, deliver as much as we wanted to, but I just want to be clear, we didn't lose money. We had all the money that we anticipated, but because of COVID. We need to roll a program another year because we just couldn't complete as much as we we could. Chris, is that okay? Yeah, that that's that's entirely accurate, Elizabeth. So the 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 initial plan was was based upon um, a number of different outcomes being achieved, which would have financial implications in terms of savings that would allow the the program to be to be self sustainable. And, and certainly, the impact of COVID was identified as one of the key reasons why why those targets weren't met. So we weren't in a position for it for it to be self self funded. Um, that said, we have we we were a trailblazer through this um, this DFE program, and we have given feedback in terms of the evaluation around the approach to. To funding because I think even COVID aside, the way in which the strengthening families work was funded is it's it's kind of high levels of funding for two years, which then comes to an end. And we have given that feedback that actually we would suggest that a more a more tapered tapered off approach to funding that perhaps it's over a, even if it's less funding over a longer period of time to allow it to gradually be be built into to, to children's services ongoing budgets as opposed to almost the cliff edge that that we've kind of felt a little bit around it so i've certainly given that feedback to to dfe through the the involvement that we've had um thank you uh, uh, moving on to uh, appendix two um there's obviously there's there's not a lot on that on that sheet but uh the first thing that jumped out at me there was children's social care staff savings uh, I was wondering whether you could talk us through. That's quite from uh, two five six to one nine five. So that's a steady decline in in that. I was wondering if there's anything that we needed to to know about how those children's social care staff savings were were being achieved and how you could assure us that that would be uh, what the implications of that would be. Bet you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, happy to take that question, Councillor, um, on Thank Appendix you. 2. Um, yeah, the, the first thing I would say is uh, an apology on this one. Since the papers were circulated, I have noticed that we actually have a typo on this one. And although it says children's social care savings, it's actually social care across the board. Um, so it, it isn't just um, that figure for children's services, it's for the whole people services department. But notwithstanding that, um, roughly about half of that uh, reduction is from children's um, services. So still quite a significant figure within there. Um, what this actually uh, relates to is a number of changes in staffing since the budgets were set last year. Um, as you can appreciate, we, we do have a, a number of staff that that turn over within the department. So we have staff leave and uh, new staff uh, replace those during the year. And what we've found is, or, or what's um, 
contributed towards this is that some of the staff that leave are more experienced staff that have been here for a number of years so they'll be higher up the grade and then they're replaced by staff um, who are, are less experienced or haven't worked for a local authority as long so that they tend to come in lower down the grade so straight away you have um, a saving uh, when one person leaves and, uh, and is replaced by somebody else that isn't as high up the grading um, as that person that has left. Um, likewise, we have a number of changes within service areas that uh, happen throughout the year. Staff, uh, for example, may go on maternity leave and when they return, they'll do slightly different hours. Um, and those hours that they don't do maybe because they're, they're working part time uh, are done differently within the team. And, and that all sort of adds up to changes within the staffing budget, along with simple things such as um, some new members of staff may not join the pension scheme where the previous member of staff did. And, and then if they don't join the pension scheme, we obviously don't have to pay those uh, pension contributions for that individual. So all of those things um, add up to um, a saving. So there isn't actually a reduction in staff within that um, that that figure there it's just a combination of lots of moves across lots of teams within uh, children's services and as you can appreciate there are quite a lot of staff in that service area so um, there are a lot of changes that that add up to those costs in terms of the reason why they reduce over the four years it's basically because as I said at the start of that is that um, somebody may replace somebody who was on a higher spinal point within the grading system and obviously as time goes on they move up the grades within the spinal points and actually catch up to the person that they've replaced at some point in time and hence um, the savings reduce or, over that period of time. Um, so as I say, but basically that, that is a combination of just lots and lots of individual changes within uh, the teams within uh, social care and what we've done is we've just merged those together in one line uh, rather than have lots and lots of lines um, on there uh, because obviously there are um, 10 or 15 teams within children's services and then uh, changes within adult services uh, etc etc so it would be quite a long uh, list with small figures but overall they add up to quite significant amounts. Thank, thanks very much Brett. Uh, on, the, on the same document we've got um support for no recourse for public funds and again there we've seen an increase there is that but then flattens out is there is that just because we, it's difficult to predict into the future or uh, is there is there a belief that no recourse to public funds w will will at some point um, go back or is that something that we're predicting is always going to increase uh, yeah, I mean, this budget pressure has been put in here based on expenditure over the last couple of years and, and in the current year. Um, and what we have seen is we've seen an increase in expenditure in this area. So we've had to make budget provision for those. Now, the, the reason why it goes up um, from the first year to the second year and, the, and then the following years is that uh, we had a similar situation uh, when we were setting the budget in previous years um, and we increased the budget, but we didn't increase it by... Um, uh, as high amount as we were now actually uh, spending now um, and also um, there was an assumption made that some of those costs would be one off so the, the the pressure that was put in going forward wasn't for the same amount every year when that pressure was previously put in what we've experienced now is that that demand's there and that demand's high and is remaining high so what we've had to do is um obviously increase the budget into the future years to take account of the fact that that demand um, is ongoing and as I say that's based on experience over the last few years in terms of um, actual demand for that support um, and children coming through the door requiring that support. As with anything it is an estimate um, once you get sort of year two, year three, uh, we've made certain assumptions on the numbers of children coming through. But again, it's due to the volatility of that. So that could move either way in the future if, if more or less children uh, are requiring that support. Thanks very much, Brett. That's it for me, Chair. OK, thanks, Matthew. Uh, quite a forensic look there then. That was very good, Matthew. Thanks. Um, we've got Mr Lindsay with his hand up. Uh, are you there, Nick? Hi, happy new year, everybody. Um, yes, I, think, I think it's probably just um, worth emphasising something in terms of the, the the dialogue and conversation that's taking place this morning. Um, a lot of the um, things that we're attempting to iron out in terms of 
um, positive outcomes for children and families requires a great level of professional challenge in order for us as services to work together to try and get to the best possible ends. And I think it's probably a, a good moment with us being just at the start of a new um, calendar year, just to re-emphasise um, how committed all different services are towards that, because the things that we're talking about creating and the things that we are looking to put in place are only as good as the second and third pair of eyes looking at it and thinking to themselves, is that enough for that family at that time? Can we do anything else? Is there something we can offer? Is there something somebody else can offer? So I think it's really important um, for everyone, councillors and everyone to understand that that, that is absolutely central to to the vision of, of how any of this can operate across the town and worth emphasising that, that education remains really strongly um, committed to that professional dialogue. Thank you, Nick. That was a comment. Have we got any more questions then? Apparently not. Um, I think then that, that we don't have any specific um, items to highlight to the uh, the, the resources and uh, economy scrutiny committee to take forward this to the cabinet, unless uh, anyone wants to suggest anything we might like to say. Councillor Hughes. Thank you, Chair. I think following on from Councillor Snedker's uh, initial question, clearly what we would have to say is that um, if there is any possibility of increasing the budget in relation to early help, that we would agree that that would be uh, an important step to save money in the longer term. So investing to save um, and and making a difference before um, there there's additional monies that need to be spent. So I think that that should be a very strong message from us. Yeah, I think um, if we and I think that's I think we're quite happy to to say that uh, Councillor Hughes, um, and I'll get um, Alison to put some words together to send to the scrutiny committee in that ilk. Anybody else want to add anything? I think I think probably that's the strongest message we've got. So maybe yeah. it may be um, appropriate just to say that, and then it'll get more attention. I was I was thank with your indulgence, Chair. If I was wondering if Chris could um, help Alison with that wording, because you know, as always, he he put he he fights his corner brilliantly, and um, it's it's lovely to hear him. So if he could he could not not saying Alison couldn't capture what was said. But if uh, if that is possible, Chair, then um, I think that would strengthen our case. So yeah, agreed on that one. Okay, I, I think that there was a, a Alison's put in that once those words are written, that the committee gave me the um, the authority to pass that forward to the scrutiny committee. If that's okay. Yeah. Are we getting nods everywhere? I'm getting a nod from Cindy. Is that all right, Matthew? Councillor yeah. Cully, yeah. Anybody disagree with that? Okay, well, I think that looks like about the end of business there. Then one other thing. One other yeah. thing. Come on, yes, uh, come on. Could I could I also suggest that within uh, those words that you present to cabinet when you have their ear, if you could also reiterate what Nick Lindsay said, in the sense that as a committee we really appreciate the fact that that's the current position, and that we would hope that resources, I mean, probably human resources more so than financial resources can be um, really supported, council uh, human resources to keep that professional dialogue um, open and positive. Thanks. Okay, I think that's a, a fair comment. Uh, it probably won't change the budget, but it's a good opportunity to say it. Are, are you still got your hand up, Cindy? Okay, well, I think that's the end of the uh, the uh, meeting, as far as I can see. Anybody got anything else they'd like to say? Well, thank you all for joining us, particularly those people that have sat through it without saying very much. Um, very nice for you to t turn up. Thank you very much. Thank and you.